Praise a higher family. He's the most high, holy and eternal, king of all kings, the only true wise and living God, the Almighty. Well, hello again, family. Hope you're all happy, blessed and well. So today is actually the Feast of Trumpets. So from sunset the 2nd of September to sunset the 3rd of September tonight is actually the Feast of Trumpets. So it also marks, well, the start of the seventh month, effectively, which is called in the Hebrew, our forefathers would have known it as the month of Ethanim, or alternatively, it's more commonly known by its Babylonian name, Tishrei, or Tishri. So coming on tonight, really just to, well, to give God thanks for the fact that it's another of his appointed times, and to explain a little bit as well about the significance of this feast as well, and also about the actual trumpets you heard. So in the recording you just heard, you heard chauffeur blasts, effectively, of varying lengths. And these really are a language of spiritual warfare as well. So each blast has a specific meaning and intent. And if you recall, it was Yahuwah who instructed the children of Israel that whenever they were going out to war against their enemies, they were to sound the shofar before them. And this would actually cause them to be brought up into remembrance in heaven before a higher. And as a consequence, he would actually come forth and go, go forth before their armies to defeat their enemies. Um, for them. So uh, it's a, a wonderful really, instrument, which of course we also remember that Yahuwah is going to also return but with the shout of the archangel and also the voice of the trumpet as well, also. So we're going to look into some of these things in today's recording. I don't want to be too long really on this. And uh, we're going to sound out also at the end with more of the shofar. But as you recall, we do also have a protocol for our videos to always leap with the word of God. So we're going to go to our opening scripture quickly now, which is Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, for our non-Sabbath day videos. And um, also we're going to come also on to discuss the fact why the Babylonian church, as I call them, doesn't keep any of Yahuwah's biblical feasts. So uh, we're going to come back and discuss all of these things. But as I say, let's go on now and do our opening reading from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. So Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 7 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So as I say, we always like to lead in, really, either with reading of the law, because the core of the law, of course, for Israel, and well, even for the New Testament church, is to walk by this commandment of love. First, we have a duty, just a reasonable basic service, to love Yahuwah. And as we've explained, he set quite a high benchmark for this love, because the requirement is that we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. And then, in addition to that, we then love our neighbor as ourselves. So that really is the core and the crux of the law in the New Testament context for us um, as believers. So if we're not doing those two things, then it's, we would argue, are we even really truly saved um, by that token? But yes. So perhaps we'll go into looking into more deeply into the actual law. What is the law for Israel? Or what is the law for? What is the law for a believer in a separate video? But as I said, we've come on today to discuss the Feast of Trumpets. So Today does really mark the beginning of quite a busy season of feasts. We have three effective feasts effectively within this month alone. Well, four, if you include the eighth day feast, which follows immediately on the heels of the Feast of Tabernacles as a separate feast. So, so uh, yes. So as I say, today is the actual first day of the seventh month. And if you recall, we have actually explained that at Repairs of the Breach, we didn't actually incorporate a 13th month into our calendar last year. 
and certainly those who say they are Jews, and many other Yashraelite camps also did uh, do that. Uh, we didn't do that, and I've given scripture and verse and done a whole video about it, because we had quite a detailed internal discussion, really, within our group um, as to why we didn't do that. Um, so, effectively, for many others, for many other Israelites and Yashraelites, their new year will be in October, beginning of October. So around about the 2nd or the 3rd of October. But you have to recall also that the first day of the seventh month also marks, well, it's one of the hallowed days. And we're going to come on to look more closely also at what that means. But essentially, Yahuwah made four divisions in the year or seasons, effectively. So the spring, the summer, the autumn, and the winter. So the first day of the seventh month also marks the first day of autumn as well. So for those who added in the 13th month into their 2023 calendar, they are effectively saying the first day of autumn will actually occur until the beginning of October, which I think really is, is far too late to say that's the onset of autumn. I think autumn would normally, and even in your just mindset, start actually before October. But um, anyway, perhaps a debate for another day. But that's hence the reason why perhaps we may seem to be a little or 30 days earlier than a number of other camps. But uh, we have made that decision not to actually add that date, not to add that additional month in. So that our 2023 calendar did not comprise 13 months, as was the case for a number of, as I say, other Israelite and Yashraelite uh, bodies and groups. So we're saying that the seventh month is also the first month of the Hebrew New Year as well. So it's a New Year's Day, effectively, also for us. So if you're counting from the month of Abib or Nisan in the calendar, in the calendar that Yahuwah gave to Moses, and you can actually see detail around that in Exodus 12, verse 2, then it would actually be the seventh month. So, as I say, the seventh month of the year was a month that our forefathers, the uh, brown Yashraelites, would have called Ethanim. And you can see that name actually given, if you look at 1 Kings 8 verse 2. So this month, Ethanim is more commonly known by its Babylonian name, Tishrei or Tishrei. And it usually occurs in the months of September to October in the Gregorian calendar system. But as I say, it's a very busy time of feasts that we're about to now go into. So today, as I said, is the Feast of Trumpets. Its official or its longer name is the Feast of the Memorial of the Blowing of Trumpets. So we are, of course, supposed to listen to trumpet blasts really throughout the day today. And I'm going to come on to explain quite briefly what those blasts actually mean, because they are a whole vocabulary and language of spiritual warfare in and of themselves. So I'm going to give you a bit of explanation, because in the recording you just heard, you heard chauffeur blasts of varying lengths. And uh, they do all have individual significance. But anyway, as we say, so this is actually the first day also of the 10-day countdown to what's perhaps thought to be the most important of all of the biblical feasts, really. Perhaps, and that's the Day of Atonement. So um, I would also encourage you, if you're not currently, um, if you haven't currently joined our blog or one of our revelational Bible study groups, to actually do so, because we do also in these days, the 10 day countdown from today to the Day of Atonement, we actually, but what we, I, we haven't really given it a name. Um, those who say they are Jews call it the 10 days of awe. Um, we're just calling it the 10 days of atonement, basically. But we do actually focus on quite a bit of preparation to prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves for the Day of Atonement to come before Yahuwah with supplication, with prayers, and also repenting and confessing of our sins as well, also. So we don't really refocus really on getting our, ourselves into the right kind of mental state um, as well to really make that approach to come before Yahuwah on the Day of Atonement. So if you are not currently a member of our one of our Bible study groups, then why not consider joining? Because we do actually keep the feasts and teach about them also and learn about um, our culture 
because it's significant that the Babylonian, I call, I call it the Babylonian church, but the Christian church uh, doesn't keep any of Yahuwah's biblical feasts, not even one. So, uh, yes, but we'll come on to talk about that a bit further, a bit more as we go further on. So, yes, in 10 days time is a day of atonement. And as I say, we do a 10 day, a 10 day lead up in looking at the whole issue of repentance. And really, it's important, it's function, really, not just in to our spirituality, but to our general overall, overall well-being. You see, Yahuwah, I guess, knew what he actually created when he created the human frame. And he didn't create the, the human body even to be able to cope with all of the psychological and spiritual junk that car that's carrying around unforgiveness um, or because it can spawn bitterness and other things in your even in your system that then begin to manifest physically that are not healthy or good for well for us. And it's not only a question that we can, perhaps can do some physical harm as well by having um, unconfessed sins perhaps and having issues or areas of unforgiveness but it's also that spiritually also it doesn't really align us to well fully where we need to be really in God in order to be really in, on a frequency to be able to communicate and receive from him as well and I've always said that we all the signature of all of the feasts all seven of them is really the whole focus is around repentance. And you'll see how closely, if you actually observe the feast, Yehuda does really keep us very, very much on the line of making sure that your heart is right, your mind is, is pure, making that sure that your hands are clean. I, I don't mean in, from a physical perspective, but I mean that you're not kind of doing anything that of which Yahuwah would be displeased, or which is sin. So that really is the whole focus really on the nature of the biblical feasts in and of themselves. It's continually coming to Yahuwah to repent, to make sure you're properly aligned, um, to receive from him, really. And it's making sure that you are in right standing um, with, with the Father at all times. Because it's, it's so easy in our day-to-day -day encounter, living in a world of sin, to really slip off at times and either to forget certain things or just to negate certain things for all sorts of reasons, pressures of life. Sometimes you just simply forget or you get carried away um, perhaps with a, a group or a set of people you fall in with. Um, and so this, this constant coming back to the biblical feast is always to pull us back to a place of right standing with Yahuwah. So they're very, very important and significant from that perspective. So as I say, we have the 10 days of atonement leading up to our day of atonement. And um, as I say, I would really encourage you to join our biblical group and learn more about the thing. Do the preparation with us. We need to prepare for this most auspicious of days. And uh, we're going to come on in the end to actually talk or look at some scriptures that really do show you the importance of this specific day, particularly for Yashraelites, because there is a, a mandate in the word of God that even declares that if we don't, as Yashraelites, come before Yahuwah on this particular day of all days of the biblical feast, that there can be a cutting off, um, as, as harsh as that may sound. But I will show you scripturally what I mean and with that and what I'm saying. So then after the Day of Atonement comes the Feast of Tabernacles or the Sukkoth or the Feast of Booths. And that's an eight day feast. And this, well, actually, it's a seven day feast. So it um, symbolically symbolizes the marriage supper of the Lamb. So all of these feasts do have significance and importance. Um, as I say, I'll come on to talk about the meanings also. So the feast of the memorial of the blowing of trumpets or the feast of trumpets, as we know it by its short name, actually means or symbolizes the return of Yeshua. So it's been pointed out that we have this quite long gap, if you think about it. We had four feasts in the spring that started off with the Passover, which was the first of the four spring feasts. 
And those are all now fulfilled fees. So all those fees have now been fulfilled. So I have actually done a separate video about this, talking about the meanings of all of the fees. And if you go to our channel and look for a video there that's called The Meanings of the Fees, it was actually recorded perhaps a couple of years ago, but it's still um, quite relevant information, just telling you the, the basic meanings of all of the fees and what they all mean. So um, by all means, do go on and have a look at that. So um, as I say, all these spring fees are believed to be fulfilled fees. They've all come to pass. So the Passover, of course, Christ was our Passover lamb. Do look at that video for further detail. I won't, I won't repeat what I've said in that video again here, um, but do look at that video to see what I mean when I say that all those fees are fulfilled because they've all literally, prophetically, can now come to pass. Um, I will personify, of course, in Christ Jesus, who came, who was, of course, our Passover lamb. But all of the autumn fees now have not yet been fulfilled. Those are prophetic fees. So these fees are now aligning us for things that are yet to come. So in, our, in Christians not really observing these feasts, they are missing out, well, on so much, really. And as I've said in previous videos, I actually began to commemorate these feasts long before I even knew that I was a Yetrolite. So when I still was believed I was a Christian in the Babylonian church system, um, I was actually observing the feasts. Where I actually, actually began to observe the feasts then. And um, I was actually having to apologize to Yahuwah for perhaps my misinterpreting some things within the feasts as I was trying to actually copy from the word of God because I was trying to literally follow from the word of God and understand myself how to keep the feasts. So in the beginning, I did things like, I did mistakes like um, eat lamb on the Passover, um, for instance. So um, it's impossible really to do the Passover correctly um, if you're eating lamb, because of course you're required to take a whole lamb um, and to actually cook the whole of it whole and then eat whatever you're eating as part of the feast and then dispose or burn the rest of the carcass. It's not to remain overnight. So it really is impossible to do that correctly. And of course, you have to recall that now, as I say, it's a fulfilled feast. There isn't now a requirement on us any longer to now actually eat lamb um, on the feast specifically um, as well. So normally I just have a very elaborate meal. I have, I, I normally I do like a banquet um, in my home and have just a very elaborate meal usually by candlelight or something quite nice to make it more of an occasion um, as well. Um, and we can kind of have any meat that we, or, or fish. Sometimes I've even served as well, a meat and fish. So, uh, but anyway, it's possibly too much detail. <laughs> but, um, but yes, but if you're looking at Getchel, what Yuhur actually says in Leviticus 23, well, let's just have a quick look at what he says here. He says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So we can see, really, the feasts are really divine appointments. They are holy convocations. So what does that mean? Well, we're really meant to come together, really, with other believers really, on this day. So I have a holy or a gathering that's really focused on Yahuwah, really. So these, that also means if they are holy convocations or appointments, that also a higher himself personally makes himself available to draw nearer to his people at this time as well, to speak with them, to commune with them as well. And one of the beautiful things I think is so wonderful about the feast is you really see the nature of Yahuwah in how well, how, I guess the, the importance he places on the family and relationships and personal interactions and with others, really, because another kind of aim of the feast, besides drawing nigh to meet together with the higher and to ensure that we are in a correct mind state, is also ensure we're actually reflecting that onto others around us as well. So to ensure that we're also loving those around us. So we're bringing our families together to take a point and moment in, in time, in time, really, to just pause from the busyness of, and the rushing around and the chaos that life can sometimes be um, when we are kind of so busy um, with work and all the other activities, of course, we need to do to, to live. But it really does provide us with a point or a moment in time to pause. And you can see that you who are even having given us the Sabbath day in really having 
is really saying to us, really, that we do, as people, need each, even each week to take a time to pause, to slow down, to just focus or recenter ourselves. And the best way that we can do that is by centering ourselves on him. So in doing that, we're using you as a, a kind of rock, as a kind of anchor, if you like. So when we're kind of getting too far away from the shore, Yahuwah is able to pull us back to where we need to be spiritually by giving us this point in time, this Sabbath day or a feast day, to really come back and to recenter ourselves and to recenter ourselves and to refocus ourselves and our aim and our focus purely on Him. And that is a grounding force, really, just for our basic lives, um, essentially, which is so, so very important. So as you can see, the feasts are Yahuwah's appointed times. They are holy convocations that we're meant to be gathered together to meet with him. And also, of course, Yahuwah makes it, well, pleasurable for us as well, because they say he also has designed that we meet together usually around a feast, around good food um, and, and good drink um, as well. Um, so, so we do actually meet together with him. And bring our families and people together as well. So as I say, having got us ourselves, our hearts in right state, with, in right standing with Him, He then well almost requires us to do the same thing with our family as well to pull them all together into this collective, um, to come together to connect with each other and to love each other um, as well. As I said, the actual aim of the law and for us, the rule for us as Christians is to walk by this commandment of love. And that's very, very important. And uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us the properties of love, really, and how we are, and to display that to others. So yes, yeah, so after the Feast of Tabernacles, immediately on the end of that seven day feast comes the eighth day feast. And um, the eighth day feast now does really symbolize the millennial reign. So to summarize, so we're saying, essentially, the Feast of Trumpets symbolizes Yahuwah's return. The day of, and the Day of Atonement symbolizes the Day of Judgment, essentially, in heaven. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Sukkoth, or the Feast of Booths, as it's sometimes known interchangeably, symbolizes the Marriage Supper of the Lamb and the Eighth Day Feast, which, as I say, is follows on the eighth day, immediately after the seventh day, Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkoth, symbolizes, some say the onset of eternity, but it really symbolizes the onset of the millennial reign. So, you know, that after the millennial reign, because of course Satan is bound for a thousand years, that after the millennial reign, he's released for a little season. And then after that um, comes a white throne judgment. And then is actually the onset of eternity um, itself as well. So these feasts are meant to be very, very happy times. I mean, the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement is the only feast that is mournful. And of course, on that feast, we are required not to eat or to drink for 24 hours. So from the sunset, which, which this year will be from sunset Wednesday the 11th to Thursday the 12th of September 2024, um, we're required to neither eat um, or drink for that 24 hour period um, of that feast. So as I said in that recording that you heard, you heard shofar blasts of varying length. And as I say, they are a method of spiritual warfare. So you heard four different lengths of blast in that uh, recording. The names of these blasts are called, at least, at least those who say they are Jews, they call this these blasts Teruah, Shevarim, Tekia, and a great Tekia. So Teruah are just nine short staccato blasts that you heard. And these really do, are, are like a sign of, these are like an alert to attack. So of course you recall that Israel always went forth to battle for her enemies with the shofar, with the shofar blast. So these were, are a symbol to really attack, to move forward, to advance and to attack, and to be assured that Yahuwah would actually cause our, our enemies to be brought under our feet as we move forward. So they was, uh, it's, it's both used to sound an alarm of approaching danger and also to mobilize Israel to take up her arrows, her bows, all their implements of war, and to move forward to attack the enemies as well. 
Then there's, you also had a medium blast as well. Of just one medium length blast. It's called a chevrolet. And that blast is meant to kind of wear down kind of everything that resists Yahuwah in the air and the atmosphere. Because, of course, you recall that the actual um, realm, what I mentioned that we war against, is really mobilized in the air and the atmosphere and that's around us. So these blasts are meant to actually wear down or to bring down anything, anything that resists um, Yahuwah. So it symbolizes a, a wearing down, a breaking down, a tearing down, and also a breaking through as well of God's power and God's anointing as well upon against the enemy to subdue all things um, under himself. Then you heard a single long blast. It's probably one of my favorite blasts, actually, uh, the Tekiah. A single long blast. And that blast actually establishes Yah, his anointing, his power, his ascendancy, um, in the earth, over the earth as well. And then you heard a great tekiah. And by the time you heard a great tekiah, that, that's final. It finally establishes God's sovereignty, his purpose, his anointing, his ascendancy, his authority, and his rule over all the people, the territory, the environment that over which it is blown, essentially. So that's what the actual blast actually, actually signify. So when you have that knowledge, you listen to the blast, it can have quite a powerful effect, well, even in your spirit, because you know that uh, Yahuwah is essentially going before us and fighting our battles for us, even as he has promised. And I, I did have, actually have the scripture to show to you. So sounding the shofar is a powerful mechanism of a spiritual warfare. So as you can see here in Numbers 10 verse 9, which tells us Yahuwah's instruction to us about blowing up the shofar. So Numbers 10, 9 is reading, or 9 to 10, is reading, when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you'll be remembered before the Lord your God, and you'll be saved from your enemies. And so it's saying here that we're also to sound the shofar in the day of, in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months. You shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So it's saying, so here it is, it's alluding to animal sacrifices as well, which of course is Old Testament. But of course, as we've said, the Old Testament really is the foundation for everything really in the new. And I wouldn't say that burnt offerings or, or peace offerings have altogether gone away because we still do offer offerings unto Yahuwah, but now they're offerings, of course, of our praises and of our tithes as well. So those could be also be seen symbolically as us also being able to even blow the trumpet, even over those things as well, if that makes sense. So I wouldn't uh, totally dismiss the scripture and say, oh, because it's saying here, that you should blow the trumpet over your peace offerings, um, that the whole thing, to throw the whole thing out and say, well, the whole thing then is, is then irrelevant, because that's not at all the case. If you look at Leviticus 23, but Moses actually said that these feasts are to be kept in perpetuity for Israel. So we'll come on as well to look a bit further at that. So as we've said, the... Feast of Trumpets does signify or commemorate or memorialize Yahuwah's return. Because, of course, we're told in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, For Yah himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the, de and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. So of course, here we're told about Yahuwah himself descending from heaven with a shout. And of course, we know that, uh, of course, we all know this particular scripture and the trumpet of God. So here again, so like the shofar of, of Yahuwah, the shofar of God. So, as I say, the day of, of Yahuwah's return is essentially what we see in Revelations 
chapter 6, because we know, of course, that in Revelation 6, Yahuwah does actually return on the opening of the sixth seal in heaven, if you recall. And that also corroborates with Revelation 18, which then tells you the battle that he then leads against the dragon, essentially, binding him for a thousand years and putting him into the pit, if you recall, um, in a nutshell. But it is significant that the Babylonian church doesn't give any of the biblical feasts. Really, so that really, well, anyone in Christendom who's not maintaining these feasts is really in violation of the word, in a sense, essentially, because they're not actually keeping the biblical feasts. So we've done extensive studies over the years, really, looking at, the whole, looking at this whole issue. Because we've even discovered the fact that the word holiday, or the secular term we view as holiday, in terms of having a break or taking a vacation, actually does come from the Bible. It actually does, is a term that comes from the word holy day. Of course, because Yahuwah's holy days were supposed to have been mankind's holidays. But, uh, of course, because we live under another system, another paradigm, um, the church today doesn't maintain those holy days. Instead, they've imposed their own holy days which, as we had explained, actually came down from paganism in antiquity, essentially. And we explained really the whole history of Constantine and how he Christianized his kingdom, essentially, and how he had to make many compromises to the pagans within his domain at his time. Because, of course, in the times of Constantine, the world, the world was a very volatile place. There were many upheavals and wars, you know, rumors of wars. So in order not to have revolt um, in his actual... Um, reign in his kingdom, he had to make many concessions to the pagans. And so one of the things he did was he essentially took all of the pagan holidays and he Christianized them or put a Christian type face around them. And they became the actual churches, holidays or holy days, and those other days that we celebrate to this day, such as Easter, Christmas, Halloween. There's a debate, some Christians say, well, that, that's not an official day, but really, in essence, it, it essentially is, um, as well. So, and Valentine's Day as well as another kind of semi-official, not official that the church doesn't essentially kind of um, completely kind of draw to its bosom and own, but nevertheless, it is one of the actual days that actually emanated from this system. So essentially, we have an issue whereby, I guess, not enough Christians actually, well, do according as it is written. Because if you, if you take the word of God and you do what's written in it, um, I guess it's, it's, it's easier not to fall into, fall into such traps. So as I say, we are now in the run-up to the actual... Uh, atonement, Day of Atonement. And um, I'd just like to show you something that the Word of God says about the Day of Atonement, because this is so uh, serious, or has very serious implications for Yashraelites, of course, because it is a part of our covenant um, as well. So let's have a look at what Moses actually said, or the instruction he gave to Israel. And of course, as I explained the instructions that Moses gives in Leviticus 23 are for perpetuity. They are meant to be an eternal commandment for Israel to actually adhere to and to keep. Let's have a look and see what Moses actually says here about the Day of Atonement. So I'm going to read here from Leviticus, from Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 32, which reads... And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this month, of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be, that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. 
And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that same soul will I destroy from, from among the people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the in the ninth day of the month at even. Even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So you can see the seriousness, really, of what I'm saying here, really, because it's saying that for any Yashraelite, specifically, that doesn't come before Yahuwah on this tenth day of the seventh month, it says they shall be cut off from among the people, as in, as in death, cut off, saying here. And just to make it more strong, in case you weren't sure, that's what Moses was actually saying here. It goes on in verse 30 to say, And whatsoever soul it be, that even doeth any work in that same day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. And then it goes on to really just remind us that this is a statute forever, that we're meant to adhere to forever. So it's saying, you shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So no matter where you're living in the world, in all your dwellings, this is a statute or a memorial that we are commanded to observe forever. So you can see what I'm saying there about the very serious implications for Israel as well, for those who don't come before Yahuwah on this specific day. As I said, I don't want to be too long really on this particular um, session, really, just to come on briefly to say, happy Feast of Trumpets to you. And uh, now that we start readying ourselves really for the Day of Atonement, and uh, the Day of Atonement, as I say, will be this year occurring on sunset from sunset Wednesday the 11th to Thursday the 12th of September, 2024, as well. So just a reminder there, Leviticus 16.31, where Moses again is reiterating, this is a Sabbath of rest, a solemn rest for us, which means we're not permitted to do any work whatsoever on this particular day. So I normally um, do take the day off from work on this particular day to make sure I'm at home. And uh, we're commanded then to afflict our souls, so namely to fast, to spend the day in supplication, in prayer, and uh, also repentance as well to you who are on this particular day. So as I say, do by all means join our revelational Bible group, as we also run through our program as well, of 10 days of supplication, repentance, of atonement, and to finally the day of atonement in preparation for this particular feast day. So I hope that's been a blessing to your family. So remember, you and I, we are the repairers of the breach. As per Isaiah 58, 12, hashtag, we will restore his paths. And also just before I go, I would like to, well, sing um, a song for you. And this song really is our signature theme for this year's Day of Atonement. And uh, I hope it will be a blessing. Goes them. Give me a clean heart so I can serve you. Open my eyes so that I can be used by you. Yahuwah, for all these blessings, Lord, we're not worthy. Give me a clean heart. Give me a clean heart. Uh, yeah, give me a clean heart. And I'll follow thee. Give me a clean heart. So I can serve you. Open my eyes so that I can be used by you for all these blessings. You who are not, I'm not worthy. Give me a clean heart. 
You would give me a clean heart. Yes, give me a clean heart. And I'll follow thee. So, so I, hope that's, I hope that song was a blessing, that you could learn to sing that also. Um, that's our signature theme or chorus for uh, the Atonement this year. Or a, a chorus I'm imparting, teaching and imparting to the group. <laughs> so God bless family. We'll play out now with more of the trumpets. Thank you.